Hey, what's up guys? Thank you for joining me on part 3 of our Wilderness Survival episode. If you missed part 1 or part 2 of the series, I will include a link to those episodes in the description tab below. Today we are going to dive further into Wilderness Survival and talk about mental preparedness and what kind of mindset you need before venturing out into the wild, being comfortable with being uncomfortable, and a few ways to repel insects from items you will often find in the wild. So we're going to go ahead and dive into the episode, but before I start, I need to throw up a quick legal disclaimer. I am not a doctor, and I am not prescribing anything to you. If you find yourself in need of medical attention, please seek out a doctor. The views on this show are mine. If you don't agree, I would encourage you to have a civil discussion like adults and post reliable sources backing up your claims. Ultimately, it's my show, so I get to talk about whatever I wish, and I don't really care if it offends or bothers you. Alright, so you're about to embark on your journey into the wilderness. You have your first aid kit, a reference guide of edible plants, some tools, you provided a thorough gawa, and you know what to look for or where to set up camp at. So, what's next? In my opinion, probably the most overlooked aspect is mental preparedness. What are you going to do if disaster were to strike? You have a first aid kit and multiple means of communication, but what happens if you don't have service or you're not able to use them? Well, let's look back to episode one. Remember the rule of three. You can survive three minutes without air, three hours without warmth or shelter, three days without water, and three day or excuse me, three weeks without food. So hopefully it won't happen, but you should be prepared for the worst at all times. What good is a first aid kit going to do if you don't understand how to use each tool in your kit? Probably not very much good. Um, I would strongly suggest to you that you receive some degree of formal training before venturing out into the wilderness. It could very easily save someone's life or your own. Next, I want you to give yourself a reality check. I mean, a real reality check. If you've never attempted a short route day hike, you're probably not ready to go on a through hike or a multi-day backpacking trip. What is your experience? What's your physical conditioning? What obstacles are you likely to encounter? And do you have the necessary resources and training to deal with them accordingly? I'll tell you guys, my longest distance to date in one single day is 38 miles through the Pike National Forest. I had 40 pounds on my back, and believe me, I didn't just wake up one day and attempt this. You need to condition yourself to your altitude, your terrain, the weather, and condition yourself to the weather within safe means. I'm not advising or encouraging you to go out and do any extreme deliberate cold exposure or heat exposure. You know, be logical and safe about it if you're not sure if it's safe. It probably isn't, or you should probably seek out the advice of a doctor. Um, get your feet and legs used to the effort beforehand. Get comfortable with your gear and know how to use it. It's basically all going to be about gaining a mastery of skills. So when you do decide to go out, you're ready for it. You're breeding a sense of confidence within yourself. So you want to have that confidence instilled within yourself before you go out on your journey. Alright, so what happens if I'm uncomfortable while I'm out in the wilderness? Well, you're going to be uncomfortable. There's no if about it. The question is going to be how uncomfortable. Well, this is mainly going to depend on how well did you prepare and how well did you pack. Did you bring multiple changes of clothing and socks? Are they inside of a dry sack or a waterproof container? We've all had wet feet at some point in our lives. 
imagine it's below freezing and your boots and socks are soaked through and you don't have a change you're going to experience a very high level of discomfort and probably hypothermia or even death do yourself a favor buy some waterproof boots mitigate risk and possibilities for discomfort before they happen finally we're going to discuss bugs and insects before you head out you could have procured your own repellent but we're going to assume that you did not what are some ways to keep yourself from being eaten alive while you're out there so first and foremost be sure that you are checking very often for ticks the United States hosts over 10% of all tick species known in the world and each one of these species can pose a significant risk to any outdoor enthusiast transmitting diseases such as Lyme's disease, anaplasmosis, which will destroy your red blood cells, and Rocky Mountain spotted fever, just to name a few. So check for ticks, check thoroughly, check often, make sure that you are properly removing them. It's going to be better to pinch your own skin and cause some discomfort and know that you got the whole head of the tick out of your or out or off of your system um, you can use heat I usually don't have to use heat um, secondly let's be mindful of where we're placing our gear it may be convenient to place your stinky boots outside of your tent at night but what happens if a scorpion or a spider were to crawl into those unattended boots or whatever other garments you may leave outside well, when you go to put the clothing on, the animal is going to be pressed up against your skin, ultimately biting or stinging you. Gear that isn't being used should be put away or moved out of any potential creature's reach. So, if it's your boots and you're letting them air out or dry out, keep them in your tent. Don't hang your jacket on a branch outside of your tent. You know, if it's wet and it needs to air out, you know, hang it up in your tent. Anything else, if it's not airing out or drying out, just go ahead and pack it away in your pack. So you're checking often and thoroughly for ticks. You're being responsible with your gear, but you're still getting bit by mosquitoes and other insects. What can I do? Well, you could use wild plants as repellents. Um, and before you go out and you start smearing wild plants all over your body, use a plant guide to make a 100% positive identification. It's not going to do you any good if you smear poison ivy or poison oak all over yourself in an attempt to keep the bugs away. Some examples of wild plants and methods that could provide some natural insect repellent are going to be the pawpaw tree, which is usually found along rivers and waterways throughout the eastern United States. Simply crush and wipe the leaves on your skin. Um, it's a pretty fair natural insect repellent. It can be found all over the eastern United States. Furthermore, pine trees, the sap or the resin, can be used as another natural repellent for insects. And not only is it a natural antiseptic, pine sap is also anti-inflammatory, and its sticky texture may help with closing wounds. Third thing we're going to talk about is smoke. Remember when you were a kid, your grandparents had like a cedar chest. So cedar has been known to be a strong repellent and the bark is going to smolder rather than bursting into flames, providing you with some relief. You may find it beneficial to create a small fire on the bare floor of your wilderness shelter to drive out any unwanted guests before you decide to sleep or rest in there. Um, just simply cover yourself in the smoke. You can put the fire or whatever you have that is creating the smoke upwind of yourself where it could coat your shelter it could coat you and driving out any unwanted pest another useful way to keep bugs at bay when plant scents aren't enough 
is it would probably be time to give yourself a mud bath so most bugs aren't going to try to penetrate the physical barrier of mud and it's also can be useful for hiding your scent which might come in very handy if you are hunting if you've ever been hunting before you know they sell all kinds of repellents um, scent and odor blockers and mud is a natural form of that so kind of multi-use there but I would definitely suggest you know even if it's just your exposed parts like your arms or your calves whatever you have going on I would suggest smearing a little bit of mud on yourself All right, so that's about all that I have for these topics. I'm gonna go ahead and wrap this up. Uh, we dove a little into mental preparedness, mindset, being uncomfortable, and some ways to repel insects. I'm going to do one more part of this podcast where we're going to just cover some general knowledge and provide some further tips and resources that you might find useful while out in the wilderness. And yeah, I hope you enjoyed part three of this multi-part episode. If you did, please remember to leave a like and let me know what you think in the comments below. If you haven't already subscribed, I hope to have earned your subscription today. Thanks for tuning in, and remember, no cool shit ever happened with I was sitting on my couch. Get out there and enjoy life. We'll see you in the next one, and until then, God bless.